Lyndon Dassey trial transcript day three, page 103, continued cross-examination with Sherry Cohane. At any time, do you recall independently, or if you need to review your notes, any item that was positive for some sort of a extractable fluid, such as blood, sweat, saliva, that in, under comparison, matched with Brendan Dassey? No. The answer is there weren't any? No, there were, of all of the samples that I extracted evidence samples and developed a profile were from, none were consistent with Brendan Dassey. Thank you. Attorney Freeman, nothing else. The court, any redirect? Attorney gone. Yes, Your Honor. Few. The court, go ahead. Questions. Redirect examination by attorney gone. Ms. Colhane, do you know how many total items of evidence, approximately, the Madison Crime Lab received in this case from law enforcement? I believe there was a, about 350 submissions, and that was just in this one case? Correct. Is that the largest number of submissions that Crime Lab has ever received? I believe so, yes. And how many of those submissions, do you know how many of them came to your unit, the DNA unit? About 180. So law enforcement submitted about 180 samples for potential DNA testing? Yes. Did you examine in some form or another all of those submissions? Yes. Would you explain to the jury what is the range of tests or examinations you do for an item of evidence? Well, again, a lot depends on the type of case it is and the request that, that may be made. Um, in a lot of these particular items of evidence, I was looking for a transfer of blood, okay? Blood was found in the RAV4. Um, this was a homicide case, so obviously blood would be a potential, a very important potential biological material. So I was focusing on the presence or absence of blood in most of these um, pieces of evidence. However, in some cases, it was more the information or the question we were trying to answer was more who touched this item or who may have touched this item. Um, and in those instances, blood wasn't necessarily the, the primary focus. The primary focus was, was there DNA on that, that evidence, and who may it have belonged to? So those kind of decisions are made routinely by all analysts as you go through the evidence based on what the piece of evidence is, what type of case it is, and what information you may have at the time. And of course, during the course of the investigation, a request can be made from anyone to go back and look at other items of evidence or um, examine for different biological fluids or whatever. At some point, a request can always be made uh, to go back. Of those 180 samples that were submitted to the DNA analysis unit, do you know about how many tested positive for blood? 41. And did I ask you, this 180 that were submitted to you, is that the largest amount of submissions for one case that your unit has ever received? It's the most I've ever received. I'm, I'm not sure about the unit. But you said that 41 tested positive for blood? Correct. And then did you carry each of those on for DNA testing further? I attempted uh, some type of further testing on them. In some cases, the, even though the test may indicate there's, you know, if, if the preliminary test may be positive for blood, when we finally extract it, part of our procedure in the extraction is to quantitate or to find out how much DNA you actually have in your samples. And in some of these samples, the level of DNA or the amount of DNA there was below the limits of detection for our system. In other words, there wasn't enough there to go any further with. And even if there, let's say there, your system can say, well, there is enough to go forward and you do go forward with other steps of the tests, are there other limitations that you still may not develop a profile? In some cases, it may depend on the sample. If there's a degradation, if there is, um, uh, you may have your quantitation part of the part of the procedure may tell you you have enough DNA, but when you actually amplify or you try to make copies of those uh, target portions of DNA, um, you may just may not develop a profile. And in that case, um, because of the condition of the sample or whatever, there's just no profile there to be developed. So as opposed to what we may see on CSI and Law and & Order and other shows, there are detection limits built into the system itself. Is that fair to say? Yes, there are. And I want to talk a little bit about the different samples that have come up now. You found complete DNA profiles from blood swabbings in the car, correct? Yes. You found Stephen Avery's from blood? Correct. You found Teresa Hallbox from considerable blood stains in the rear cargo area, correct? Yes. And you could carry the system through to get a complete full DNA profile? Yes. Now we talked a little bit, or I think Defense Counsel has asked about um, what's referred to as touch DNA? Yes. Understand what I'm talking about or what we're talking about when you say touch DNA? Yes. Could you talk about the limitations or the sensitivity of the system and the differences between having a blood standard and what you think may be touch DNA? Could you explain that to them? 
most of the time when you have a blood sample, you have a, a, a large, large amount of DNA to work with. Our systems are very sensitive um, and we get, we can get very good results on most samples. However, uh, there is a limitation to the system. When you're talking about a blood sample, you're talking about a lot of cells in most cases are present in that, in that sample. If you have enough blood to see a reddish brown stain, you've got a lot of cells. When you're talking about a touched item, you're not necessarily um, targeting a specific stain. If I were to touch this, um, all I can do is swab the area that I touched and what I'm looking for is a transfer of epithelial or skin cells that may have been transferred from my hand to the item. Um, so it's not quite the same thing as actually looking at a, at a blood or a semen stain where there's plenty. In most cases, plenty of DNA um, to sample. When you're looking at a touched item, you're looking at very small amounts of DNA. And also, if you're looking at a touched item that um, is an item that could have been touched by more than one individual, in some cases you're going to get mixtures of DNA. Some cases you won't. Some cases you're going to get DNA from the last person who touched it. A lot of that depends on the person themselves. Most of us, when we touch items of evidence, we leave um, some of our DNA behind. But some people leave more than others. Some people naturally shed more cells than others. So if you're a person who sheds a lot of cells when you touch something, you are probably going to leave behind more DNA than someone who does not naturally shed that many cells. So when we're looking at touched items, all of these variables and all these factors come into play, and all of this determines whether you're going to get a usable profile from a sample or not. And when you talk about someone being a good shedder or a poor shedder, does the surface that's touched have any impact on whether you'll find a sufficient DNA to develop a profile? Yes, if you're touching something rough, uh, like a piece of wood maybe, or um, I don't know, a rough surface, you're probably going to leave more cells than if you're touching a smooth surface, probably. And again, these are generalizations. These are not rules, and these are not always exactly the same. Um, smooth surfaces, sometimes there's not as much uh, DNA left behind, but again, that's not to say that you can't get a profile from a smooth surface. They're just generalizations. An example would be, and I believe Mr. Freeman handed you the 22 caliber rifle, correct? Yes. And you swabbed the barrel? Well, you looked for blood and did not find any, correct? Yes. And then you swabbed the trigger guard? Yes. But according to your notes, as I recall them, you developed some DNA, correct? Some DNA markers? I, yes, I developed one marker. And I think you referred to it as res, uh, finding some trace DNA being present? Correct. So if there, is it a limitation of the system to develop the full profile? Or could it be that whoever touched it just did not leave enough or the surface wasn't sufficient to gather enough? It's probably a combination of all three. I, there's no way to tell exactly why. Um, the bottom line is the person who touched it may not have shed enough DNA. Um, the DNA itself may be degraded, not of, of good enough quality to get a full profile. So it's probably a combination of all those factors. And that would be the same for license plates. The same factors would uh, determine whether DNA was left on license plates if they were touched by someone. Yes, that's correct. And that, of course, is also going to be assuming someone's not wearing gloves or using something to put in between the item and their hands or whatever. Right. I'm, I'm making the assumption that you're actually touching it with your skin, your bare skin. And um, Mr. Freeman asked about the key, and you found Stephen Avery's profile on that key, correct? Yes. Have there been any studies done or any literature that talks about this um, somewhat? I think you stated that you generally will find the profile of the last person who touched it. Is that correct? Did you say that? Yes. Could you explain that to the jurors more? Well, again, there have been studies done about uh, transfer and how much, how much you have to handle something, um, what, what factors are involved in transferring DNA by touched items. And again, these are not, these are generalizations. And in a lot of cases, it has been found that transfer of DNA happens instantaneously, um, and it's usually either the last person that touched the item or you're going to get a mixture of DNA. And again, this is simply a generalization. Um, you may get mixtures of DNA from several different people who have touched it, or you may just get a single source DNA. And I believe also Mr. Freeman asked you whether there was any blood on the pants of Brendan Dassey that were submitted. Do you remember that? Yes. And I believe your, and what was your answer to that question? There was no blood found. Um, do you recall what you put in your notes when you examined the pants of Brendan Dassey? Um, yes, I can refer to those notes. Um, in my notes, I described the size, um, what brand they were. Um, my notes read that they're fairly clean, large areas of whitish stain, looks like staining from bleach, no stains consistent with the appearance of blood. There was one small brown stain on the leg of the jeans, and that was negative for blood. 
I've put up what has been previously marked as Exhibit 54, and are these the genes of uh, Brennan Dassey, do you recall, that you examined? I believe so. And you note in your notes that there appear to be bleach stains, correct? Yes. And what, um, what does bleach do to DNA? Um, bleach basically chews up DNA and destroys it. We use bleach in the laboratory, a 5% solution of bleach to clean our bench tops, to clean all of our scissors and forceps, um, to make sure that we don't have any DNA that's, that's left on our, our bench tops uh, or pipettes or any of the instrumentation that we use. And I'm sorry, you use bleach to clean your instruments, you stated? Yes. And the reason being because it basically kills the DNA? Yes. And um, if these, if pants have been washed a number of times, or uh, what is that going to do to potential DNA if you've had a number of washings of pants? Well, in most cases, DNA is, is if it's going, if it's in a, a material like blood or semen or a biological fluid, it's going to be soluble in water. So the more times you wash it, uh, depending on how thorough you wash it, what type of, you know, whether you wash it with bleach, whether you wash it, what type of detergent you use, um, eventually it's going to destroy the DNA or at least wash it from the garment where we would not be able to detect it. And so cleaning materials like bleach or wiping surfaces clean, that all also would have an impact on whether you will find DNA on a particular item to test? Yes. And is there anything in the literature that uh, discusses what the absence of DNA at a crime scene means? Um, most of the references that you see in the literature, the absence of DNA is basically inconclusive. The presence of DNA obviously uh, point to some sort of physical contact. Uh, the absence of DNA, because there's so many variables, it either there was no contact, it wasn't there in the first place, or it's been destroyed by some environmental factor, or it's just in a level that's too low to detect. So basically the absence is an inconclusive uh, conclusion. And all the other variables kick in too, whether someone's a good shedder or bad shedder, correct? Yes, correct. The surface area that perhaps the biological substance is left upon, correct? Yes. Whether someone's cleaned it up or not, correct. So the absence of DNA at a crime scene does not mean someone was not there? Well, the absence just means that there's no DNA that we can detect. Thank you, that's all I have. The court, any recross? Attorney Freeman. A few, Judge. Recross examination by Attorney Freeman. Uh, one of the comments I think Mr. Gahn was asking was about blood and comment about touching items versus um, a blood stain, for instance. It's easier to see blood, correct? Yes. Would you agree it's easier to develop DNA profile from blood than from possibly a touched transfer of DNA? Well, it depends on how much blood is there, but if you have a, a visible blood stain, a fairly visible blood stain with a lot of material to work with, um, you'll probably be able easily to develop a DNA profile. It's it's hard to compare the two because there's no visual um, measure between the two. There may be a touched item that you have with lots and lots of DNA on it. There may not, but you can't really see that. There also may be touched items with very little DNA that you can't really see. One you can see, you think you could more easily extract DNA from something that you can't see. Um, I suppose I would agree with that. Well, one of the comments you made on redirect was there are more cells available in a blood well, if you have a fairly large blood stain, again, you're talking about a, a, I was referring to the stains primarily that I recovered from the RAV4. If you have a very light blood stain and you don't have very much, I mean, it's a very weak blood stain, stain, you may have not have that many cells in that as well. But the fact that you just, I think, mentioned it, the fact that it may be, it may be blood doesn't mean you can't extract d the DNA sample from that item. It just depends on whether or not the the, you know, whether or not there was a transfer of some sort of biological fluid or cell from a touch, for instance, that you can actually be able to uh, extract and develop into a profile. Correct. Okay, so for instance, you had mentioned the bullet fragment FL. You weren't able to discern um, blood on the bullet? Not visually, no. Visually, right. And, but you were able, you said you, I think you said you washed the bullet? Yes. And able to extract DNA from that that matched Teresa Halbach? Correct. You tried the same with the bullet FK and unable to do so? Correct. And that would be the same with such things as shell casings, for instance. You could probably wash those to extract potentially a DNA sample or something that might be able to develop into a profile? Correct. But, but again, you didn't do that in this case? That's correct. So I guess the issue is if you don't try, you won't know, right? If you don't try to extract DNA from something, you don't know if it's there. That's correct. 
In regards to the, the genes, question was raised about there, you noticed some white specks and a light um, kind of brushed area that appeared to be bleach? Yes.